And we are here. Oh, I am so excited for this podcast episode. This is seven years in the making. This is <laughs> the most amazing podcast we're going to have. And I'm going to first sing all the praises for this. If anyone does not know who Eva is, because she's humbly in the background of our gym, she is one of my best friends. She is the leader of our entire network of gyms that I'm fortunate to work with at the North Shore YMCA. Um, she is someone who's helped me personally enormously help, you know, develop myself into a better coach and as a better person. But most importantly, I am fully convinced there's no way that shift would exist without you because you helped me have a laboratory in our gym to play with new things. And you were, uh, telling me, Ooh, that sounds like a good idea or like, Ooh, I'm sorry, Dave, but that's not going to work out. And I feel like without you, there wouldn't be this podcast. I wouldn't be where I am today and nothing in the gymnastics world that I'm lucky to do would be happening without you. So I'm enormously grateful for you, but I'm so happy to have you finally on the podcast. Well, thank you for your kind words, Dave. Um, I am also grateful for you and for this opportunity. Yeah, we have so much good stuff to talk about. And I have always been chirping in your ear about, hey, you want to do a podcast? Hey, you want to do a and you're always like, no, 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 I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And uh, <laughs> Uh, it's funny to me because you talk to corporate CEOs at a multi-organizational level and don't even bat an eyelash, but then this is nerve-wracking for you. So um, I think we're in a very unique, uh, needed, but also uh, period of time that's changing very fast. And many people are a little overwhelmed with culture change, athlete A, gymnastics alliance, COVID, like all this stuff is a whirlwind. We're at 2020 is going to have quite a stamp next to it in the history books for gymnastics, especially. It sure right? will. Um, I think that I made this analogy and we have these like, we've had hundreds of hours together talking in coffee shops and talking and shout out Atomic Cafe if you want to sponsor us. Um, just hundreds of hours of talking about how do we change our program? What do we do to make the kids happier and the coaches happier? And how can we be better? And we've gone through, so, whether it was with coffee or with wine, we've gone, we've gone through the, the painstaking process of trying to improve our gym and make it better. And so I think for two reasons, one is I really want to explain to people what happens in those conversations and what we've been through. But two is I feel like many people are looking up at this giant mountain right now in their gyms about changing their culture and the hard conversations and i think we're a quarter to halfway up the mountain at a camping site and we've been through some really hard times and i mean hard financially hard coaching staff and it's hard personally for you and i and so i really want to share with people who are looking desperately for help what we've done to get where we are which i think is great compared to where we were seven years ago and we have more to go but that's why I wanted to have you on because you were the driving force behind this. Well, thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm definitely a little bit nervous, but I'm happy to talk about our journey up the giant mountain. And there's still so much more to go. But I do think that we've made tremendous progress over the years. It's been hard. It's been, it's been really hard and there have been so many wonderful blessings along the way, but, but it's been a grind. And so, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm, I'm proud of where we're at at this point. And, and I know that we have so much more to do, mm -hmm. but I do feel like, you know, if there are things that I can share that will help others, you know, kind of take that first step or get the ball rolling, then I'm happy to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny you just mentioned that. Like I was thinking about that the other day about, especially now with coronavirus, about like how much we have to clean and like all that stuff. And I was just juggling these crazy schedules. It's like, I was like in the middle of a workout and I was like, God, this is hard, man. This is so hard to do. And I can think of countless Sunday nights after a three day weekend of a meet we hosted where we're just laying on the mats, like looking at each other, like, this is awful. This is so hard, man. But then it's so yeah. hard when we see how happy the kids are and we see the coaches being happier and stuff. And you do so mm -hmm. much stuff behind the scenes. But for anyone who's listening to this, and if you're listening to this, this means that you're actively trying to change the culture in your gym or change yourself. And like, it is hard. It takes a lot of courage to stand up and try to have something be different. It takes a lot of work and consistency. And you have to make a lot of sacrifices to do the harder things that we're going to talk about. And so I applaud everyone who's trying to change their gym's culture because we know what that feels like. Um, but also, too, is, is if you're starting this journey, kind of buckle in for the long haul. This is not going to be a super staff meeting next day. <laughs> the rainbows come and the clouds open and everyone's happy in your gym. Like it's, We're like 
we're seven years into this right now. Yeah. So, um, so first let's do this. Let's just paint a little bit of context around, I guess there's three big chunks in my mind about like the, we've kind of attacked this thing in like four year chunks about how we, we tackle long-term goals. So we have the, the four years where you were there before I was, and then that was like kind of like 2011 to 2014. And then I joined in 2013, the four year chunk to like 2016, 17. And then I think we've had a very different chunk in the last four years, minus COVID, um, that we've kind yeah. of been another journey. So can you talk a little bit about first about, I guess, how you got into the program? We work at a YMCA together, which is amazing. But also, I guess, what it was like before I joined, because I think your work on the safety side and on the man, wrangling in some cra crazy times around parents and kids working is very important context. So let's start there. Okay. So I was actually hired as an associate gymnastics director in 2009, actually it was 2009. Um, and it was actually this month, 11 years ago, it was August, 2009. And so this time of year, I always have some crazy flashbacks about what I walked into. Um, and so, you know, if I just back up a little bit, I, I went to school and studied psychology, um, went to grad school for mental health counseling, worked in um, so a number of different jobs in, in the field, residential treatment centers. And, and then, you know, I was bartending <laughs> to pay the bills and my student loans. And I got a call from a former gymnastics coach who said, hey, you know, I don't know what you're up to, but a position just opened up at the Y and I thought of you and that maybe you're looking for something else. And I was really just at that breaking point with the restaurant business. I, I absolutely adore the restaurant business. I spent 10 years in it and and it has served me well, pun intended. And, but, you know, I was, I was tired of it. I needed something else, something new and was looking for a leadership position with, but I didn't really know that that's what I was looking for until I got this call. And so I said, Hey, why not? I got out of the bartending clothes and put on a suit and interviewed and was hired as the associate gymnastics director um, and head coach. So it was interesting when I walked in there, there was a lot happening. And so one of the first questions I asked, this might've been, I don't know, day two on the job was, um, could I have a roster, a gymnast roster? Because I wanted to get to know who the kids were and how many were on each level and emergency contact information. Cause I'm always thinking safety. Yeah. Yeah. And the gymnastics director at the time just kind of looked at me like this, like I had 10 heads. And so needless to say, there were there was no contact information. Not, I mean, literally this de this department was in pieces. Mm -hmm. There was no structure, not even a roster of children. Um, they were just coming in and doing gymnastics. And I literally could not tell what level anybody was. I was standing, just doing some observing when I first walked in just to kind of see where everybody was at and get to know the coaches. And so I'm watching a group and I think they're level five, just based on <clears throat> quick observations and come to find out they were level seven gymnasts. And so, you know, there was a lot. I mean, those are just a few examples of some of the things that were going on. It just it had it was a program that was and and has been long standing and had been through kind of a revolving door of leadership, directors and head coaches in and out. And these poor kids and their families had been through so much and you know we know what it's like as athletes as gymnasts we grow in our relationships with our coaches and we really form that strong coach athlete bond and then all of a sudden they just disappear out of nowhere i mean these coaches were like walking out on them right before states and so they were emotionally broken and and everywhere i looked there was 
a, a brace, a knee brace, a back brace, mm. you know, just so many injuries. So, you know, I, I sat down with, with my former coach who had called me about the position and I said, okay, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> um, and, and he had been with the program for 20 years and, and, and I said, so in your opinion, uh, what's the priority? Because I was trying to prioritize. Mm. And he looked at me and said, I am so sick of watching kids get carted out of this gym on backboards. Yeesh. That is not even like carted out, like carried like an ankle injury. Like that means that something's going on with your backboards. Spine. Yeah. Mm. So that was the moment where safety became my number one priority and it has been ever since um and i knew what to fix first <laughs> it was like yeah. okay this we're gonna this is how we're gonna dive in so anyway um long story short i eventually was promoted to the gymnastics director position and was able to oversee the entire department which was nice because i could finally have a say in what was happening at the program level and and work hard to bridge the gap between program and team and completely rewrote the curriculum for our program so that the, you know, when the kids were moving up to team that they were ready to be on team and, and that we weren't trying to play catch up. There was, there were a lot of politics going on when I walked in. Yeah, I took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> and so, you know, the gymnasts were being moved up, not because of their skill level, not, you know, it was really, you know, if, if mom helped out with the banquet, um, all of a sudden mom had the power to come in and say, stomp her feet and say, but, I think my kid should move up and then the kid gets moved up or, you know, there were a lot of, um, a lot of favoritism going on. And, and I think, you know, I don't think it's anyone's fault. I think it's just that, you know, when you have a program that people are committed to and, and they're showing up every day and they're doing the best that they can, but there's this, like I said before, kind of revolving door of leadership and directors, right. Right. each leader comes in and, and sets a different tone and has, has kind of like a different set of rules and ex regulations and expectations. And, and so it's a lot of kind of flip-flopping back and forth and people just didn't really know what to expect. And, and then, you know, as kids start to drop off all of a sudden, it's like, well, we have to keep the numbers up. We have to make the budget. We have to do all these things. So I think what, what coaches were doing, we're just trying to, appease the the parents and the kids sure go ahead move up you want it like, don't go don't go we'll work really hard won't you yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll definitely get that kit before yeah. the first meet <laughs> so the one of the biggest challenges <laughs> for me right off the bat was was helping the parents understand a new way mm. of of gymnastics and helping them understand that uh, yes this is the way it's been done before but it doesn't mean it's been the right way and the best way. Mm -hmm. So I know that this is the way you've always done it. But, you know, honestly, every time I heard that, it was it was a red flag that I needed to change something. Yeah. Yeah. So so I did. I think that I was in a unique situation and that when when I came in, I. I didn't really know anyone, you know, I had some. I had been, you know, removed from gymnastics, the world of gymnastics long enough because I spent so much time in um, in college that it's like I had enough separation that I didn't know these team families. I knew some of the coaches and, you know, there were a couple of coaches that I had really long term, long time relationships with coaches that were were a part of my life kind of in a different way and that I had kept in contact with and um, we can talk about that later but um 
you know, I didn't, I didn't really care about the politics. I didn't have anything invested in these politics. I was like, who are you? Oh, that's great that you helped organize something or that you ran, ran the score table at the meet last year. I, I don't care. Yeah. I mean, that was nice of you, but um, it's not going to change my decision about your your gymnast and and her ability to move up. Mm -hmm. So I use move up move ups as an example because I know that it's 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 a tough time of year for everyone, yeah. <laughs> and it was really hard to help get the parents on board um, with a, a new philosophy mm. surrounding move ups, really making sure that they're understanding that move up, moving up is not like another grade in school, right? It's like if, we, if we're spending another year on level six, it's we're not staying back. It's just yeah. that we're not ready for seven. Yeah. Very different way of thinking about it. They were They were really, really attached to move ups and very proud of, the, the number next to their child's name. And it was really sad. I was sad for the gymnast because I'm watching them scramble and they didn't have to be scrambling like that. So I just put a stop to it. And I said, nobody's moving up until they have all the skills for the next level. The novel concept. Novel concept, yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just saying, I think it's, you so many obviously good points to paint the picture of what was happening. I think another thing that was, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong on this because obviously I wasn't here, but I think there's obviously like the physical side of concern for injuries related to are we doing skills maybe we're not ready for, is our conditioning program maybe not put together, do we need to revisit our basics and our mastery of skill progression. But I also think from my observations and talking with a lot of people who are gymnasts in that era who are now coaches with us is that there was also some concerns about emotional well-being and mental well-being from some coaches who maybe didn't share the same values that we needed to uphold from the YMCA, but then also yep. the values that you uh, know are important, right, in terms of how do we talk to the athletes? How do we uh, discuss motivation? How do we discuss fitness overall and recovery and health and body weight and that stuff? And I think I remember a few stories from you telling me in my, in my interviews about like, you know, well, we've had some people – who maybe weren't a great fit here, but I think they were unfortunately just allowed to continue because we didn't have other positions to, to fill or whatever. So I think there's a lot of that kind of moral malalignment between some of maybe the coaches yeah. in the past that I think was causing a lot of undue stress on the kids in terms of, okay, is this about the kids' well being or is this about you and your ego and wanting to look good at meets and push up levels because we want a, a level nine team or whatever it is? And I don't know if this is true or not, but I think. That's a really important point because that's a common theme that we're going to talk about in terms of what we changed on our values as we move forward but then also a lot of people are dealing with that right now and we'll talk about parents and coaches and ourselves as, as coaches and our own personal development but i think that's what a lot of people are dealing with is like maybe that one bad character that bad egg in their gym that's just really sucking the fun out of the place and really bringing the mood down because they're living vicariously through the athlete or they're maybe not the most happy in their personal life with their career choice and their own health and wellness and they're taking it out frustration wise on everybody else and so I think it's important to mention that yeah I mean that's huge the bad eggs they gotta go they gotta go they do nothing but spoil your culture and and it is really hard to fire people it's just really hard it is especially when they have years roots in the program and especially if you have personal relationships with them oh. um and so but what you have to do is take you know a cold hard look at the big picture you know it's and this is much easier said than done, of course. But if if you can step back and kind of look at your program from a bird's eye view and say, okay, what's working? What's not working? This over here looks a little bit scary. This needs attention. This is great. We're going to continue to put energy into this. You know, I think that I spent eight years as gymnastics director and then and head coach. I was doing both and then was promoted to a director of operations position where I'm now overseeing the gymnastics departments and programs 
in our association. So we are the Why of the North Shore. We are comprised of seven sites and we have three sites that offer competitive gymnastics. And then we also have our Plasto Community YMCA up in Plasto, New Hampshire. They have a an excellent ninja course and ninja program. And then we also have um, some smaller, you know, preschool and parent-child programming happening at a couple of our other sites. So my point here is that I, you know, as soon as I was able to kind of, it became my my job to step back and kind of look more broadly at our association of gymnastics and figure out how we can, you know, streamline uh, programs. We had we were all very siloed, and everybody was doing more work than they had had to be doing. I had done so much of it as head coach and director that I had all these templates and I had all these processes and plans and. So what I've been doing the last few years is trying to help the other head coaches and directors and program staff and part-time coaches with um, curriculum and consistency and really just the core functions that are so important to our gymnastics programs and keeping our kids safe, keeping our staff safe, keeping the programs going. But I was, I'm only able to you know, help others with their programs now and continue to help, you know, our particular branch because I was so deep in the trenches, man, like just so deep in it. And like, oh my God, everyone's so unprofessional. I can't, where there's no staff shirts. Like what is happening? I couldn't tell who was a gymnast, who was a staff Never mind a parent walking in or, you know, it was just like madness. You know, the ratios were all over the place. You know, I, I'm pretty strict right now on an eight to one ratio for, for our programs. And then, you know, as the as we get into team and our team kids, like we can we can, you know, expand those ratios a little bit. But there were like 16 kids in a preschool class with one frazzled teenage teacher running around with like a chicken with her head cut off, completely flipped out. The kids are like picking their noses, picking other areas. And just, it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. Nobody, it was out of control. And then there was no attendance. Like the, nobody knew who was coming or going. Yep. Staff, yep. participants. And then I look over at what's happening with team and it's like, these kids are just being screamed at. And the coaches are, who really just didn't know any better. Yep. <laughs> Let's be fair. They just didn't know any better. They didn't have any leadership. They were just doing what they thought was the best thing to do. We haven't had great leadership I agree. I think that's gymnastics. Yes, yeah, so that sounds exactly like what I was thinking was going on beforehand. But uh, so that totally makes sense. And I think I can kind of weigh in my two cents about when I entered the program in 2013 and kind of what our middle section of the goal was, was like that 2013 to 2016, 17, which is where. So I came from a, a club background. I, I grew up in the club levels. I had worked at other club gyms. I had been in college, finishing PT school. And um, I remember that I, I got an internship close by to the gym and I wanted to do some extra coaching, but I was definitely looking for a place where I could kind of like land, you know what I mean? Because I'd always kind of hopped around in the summers or at camps and I've traveled and done some speaking and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, like it'd be cool to kind of like really sit with a team for like five years and, and develop, you know, great, great kids and great gymnastics. And so I remember um, coming down and helping and seeing kind of like the bird's eye view and remembering that like it looked pretty well put together. And I was like, oh, there's like there's things running, there's a schedule, there's, you know, it seems like we have some coaches who are pretty technically knowledgeable and they're running some stuff. Um, but I do remember me really being latched on to the fact that I was already very close to jumping ship on the club, you know, in our, in our, in America, USAG or whatever governing body. I was just like, because it just, viscerally didn't feel right to me when we would go to meets and I would watch the way that things were being run in terms of is this about the kids or is this about the parents and the coaches like just so high pressure kids getting literally yelled at in meets for missing skills um, ignored by their coaches I saw many coaches who would walk away from their athletes if they fell instead of being there for them and I was like 
I don't know if this is how we should treat kids. I don't agree with this morally. And so in 2013, I was already ready to think about an AAU or something else. And then I, I happened to be like, oh yeah, the why, right? And it was cool because at that time we had the YMCA uh, kind of inter YMCA leagues, but we also did have kids that were going to meets around that were JO and that were a club and the kids were going to States and regionals. And yeah. um, I think I remember sitting with you being like, okay, is there a way that we can build a program that moves from the, okay, we're safe to like, can we be competitive with only 18 hours a week at optional levels and more of a scientific, rational, uh, uh, you know, quality over quantity approach. And can we do that in a way that gets kids to their goals, whether that's we have some kids that literally only want to just have fun recreationally. We have some kids that want to do mid-level optionals and maybe high school gymnastics. We have some kids that are on the higher end of that and want to do other sports. But then we also have some kids that really express collegiate goals of, no, I'd like to get to the collegiate level and compete. And you and I were like, that's a tall order, you know, to have that range of people. And I think we've had like groups of 20 or 30 at times on our optional teams trying to satisfy those needs were really challenging. But I welcomed the, the challenge because I think that you had such a great overhaul of what needed to happen and i kind of saw the foundation of like i think we can work with this we just need we need to really overhaul the staff education we need to really overhaul the morals and the values and making sure that everyone is treating the kids really well and motivating the right way and that the coaches feel as though they have the tools to teach properly and they don't get flustered because many people lack education they run out of ideas so they just push harder and i also remember being like okay i think we need to really think a lot about better basics and better skill progressions yeah. and better strength and conditioning and better injury management and better flexibility methods. And I had all these ideas and, and I had a massive ego. I've, I've said this notoriously on the podcast. When I first joined the gym, I was like, <laughs> the room wasn't big enough for my head because it's like, Oh, I have a doctorate and I'm super smart. And look, at <laughs> and I remember some of our coaches being like, who is this clown right now? And yeah. it took me a year or two to get over that. Thanks to you and many others. But <laughs> at that time I remember being like, can we do something that's so blasphemous in the gymnastics culture to build healthy, happy athletes that still can get to level nine, level 10 college gymnastics. And so that was my perspective of moving in, but I'd really like to hear your thoughts on what that four year chunk entailed for us. Cause I think a lot of people are in that chunk right now. Yeah. You know, it was, we were, when you walked in, we were kind of, the gym was kind of in a space where it was like, okay, we had done this massive overhaul, you know, and there were a lot of people that helped me with this overhaul. You know, this is never, never a one person show. I mean, it really took a team effort to, to do that kind of, and get us through that initial phase. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you definitely walked in at the perfect time because we were ready for mostly ready for, you know, what you had to offer and what you had to bring. And, and I actually, Dave, I'm not sure if I've, ever told you this story, but I'm going to tell you right now. Here we go. So um, this was maybe, I don't know, a couple of weeks before you walked in. I was incredibly frustrated with our optional gymnasts on balance beam. Anyone who knows me knows me knows that beam is my favorite event coach. And I was at the end of my rope. So I called uh, Brenda Shea. She is um, a judge in our region, uh, very, very highly respected. I have nothing but respect for Brenda. She's been in this game a long time, has been a great mentor to me and actually judged me when I was a gymnast. So yeah, and so, and she's always been so great, so great to us and, and uh, willing to help out. And so I said, I'm gonna call Brenda and see if she'll come in and do a critique. So I called Brenda, I said, can you come in and look at these kids? I can't get them to connect a beam series to save my life. I I need another set of eyes. Sure. She came in and every single gymnast did their routine for her or, or at least a series. And so I walk up when the last gymnast is done, I'm anxiously awaiting this feedback and she just looks at me and says, they don't look like gymnasts. Oof. And I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, I was like, what? Like I wanted to be combative and defensive in that moment. Yep. Um, but I held my tongue and, and she said, I, I can see that you're frustrated. I can see 
that they're frustrated. And I think that they're frustrated because they're just simply not strong enough to do what you're asking them to do. Mm. It was a mind blowing moment for me. <laughs> it was, it was such an important comment. And I don't think Brenda to this day even knows what that comment meant to me and what it did for our gym because it made me take a step back and look at what I had been doing and what and how I had been coaching and how I had been teaching others to coach. And it was so like, let's do whatever we can to get these kids where they need to be so that they can move up so that we can have a good solid level eight team, a level nine team. Let's get these kids to 10. But how do we do that, right? The process of doing that was, you know, there were there were some good pieces, but there were a few missing pieces that were really important pieces to be missing. Yeah. And it, because we were missing that the proper strength program, it was holding us back and it was causing frustration. And literally two weeks later, you walked in the door. <laughs> I did not know and that. so, um, and you know, this was a time in my life when I was having a hard time delegating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we gymnasts like to control things. And so I, you know, had my hands in every, every little corner of the department. And I felt like I needed to, but and maybe I did at first when I had first walked in and it was kind of a mess. But then, you know, by the time we got to 2013, it was like, I really, we were in a place where I could pull back a little bit and I just wasn't sure if I was comfortable doing that. And so this was, Brenda's comment was a very humbling moment for me. Um, it made me step back and go, okay, she's right. <laughs> they don't look like gymnasts. What have I been doing? And then <laughs> once I got over the initial what have I been doing moment, I thought to myself, oh crap, I don't think I, I, I'm confident that I can get them where they need to be from a strength standpoint. Mm. Um, so, and, and even if I did, I really don't have the time because I'm the head coach and I'm the director and I'm doing all these things and I'm you know responsible for all these things. So, so even if I had the the knowledge and the background, um, which you know I might have had, I don't know, fifty five percent of what I needed, but like I needed someone to really come in and just take over the strength program, mm -hmm. and and so that moment that I realized that I shouldn't be doing this. I, why, why would I try to do this? Cause you better believe I was like, I had my spreadsheets going. I was, you know, I love spreadsheets. I was, I had it go. I was like, okay. Yep. And then, you know, I got halfway through maybe 16 different spreadsheets and I was like, what am I doing? I'm not the one to be doing this. So, um, I called a meeting with you and I asked you to take over the strength program Remember and that. that I need you to just take it from soup to nuts. I'm going to back off. We can review it together. You can present the plan to me. I will give, you know, suggestions if I'm feeling like, yeah. you know, okay, the choreography is getting a little wobbly. Can we get something going for these feet, for these calves? The calves look a little weak, like, you know, I've thrown things like that at yeah. you over the years, but but it I made it my mission to accept the fact that I was not qualified. Yeah. And I didn't have the 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 time to give it what it needed. And that I had this perfectly capable, incredible person to to delegate this to that I needed to be okay, first of all, with the concept of delegating. So that was the thing. And then um, also just letting go, like just let, I had to just let go yeah. of holding 
so tightly onto everything. And, you know, we hold tight onto these things because yeah. we care, right? We love it. We care and we want to, we think that if we, if we squeeze harder that it will stay together. Yeah. Um, yeah. You gotta let go. Yeah. You gotta let go and you have to delegate to the people who know what they're doing. And if you delegate to the people who know what they're doing, then they will feed your program mm. with knowledge, with love, with support. And everybody feels it. Yep, absolutely. In a positive way. Yes. That so great. I love that. I did not know that was a story. And there's there's three really, really important things I want to highlight. Number one is that when you had that moment with Brenda, that must have been the biggest gut punch ever. Oh. Because you, you like, not only do you think you're a beam queen and you're pushing super well, yep. you're Congress, you know, the best drills, you're doing the strength program, yep. and then you get that and you get sucker punched. And I think it's a big ego check. And that's kind of what I went through on the, the coaching side as well about like thinking I knew so much and I, and I knew it all. And I had listened to all these coaches, blah, blah, blah. And then really to myself realizing like, oh no, like I, um, I don't know the best way to teach a really good shoot over. I've been faking it. For the last, I've been spotting my way with little kids to make it look like they could do a shoot over, but then the wheels fall off when I, when we try to progress. Right. And so I think it's really important that people take that point. A uh, big reason why you were a catalyst towards change. And when I was involved is you were willing and able to hear feedback without getting defensive. And I think that's a big issue a hurdle that a lot of people are facing is they can't accept constructive criticism and there's an error on both sides. One is that the person delivering it is attacking you and they're, they're coming at you hot and you're getting defensive immediately. And I think that's something you need to work on if you're giving constructive criticism. And I think you and I are so good together with, between our own, you know, improvements, but also working, you're so good working with our coaching staff because you're never attacking someone. Thank you. Hey, here's, here's an opportunity that we can get better. Um, but also is that so many people are getting feedback and the first thing they do is screw you brenda what do you mean i don't know how to teach beam you know what i mean like i've been doing, i've been doing gymnastics for 25 years like i'm a g like i got this down right and in reality you need to really have a moment of pause there and be like huh okay is there something i'm missing here do i need something new and it leads to the third point which i think is really not on your shoulders for this but you thought you were doing exactly what you needed to do for a strength program. You were following, I remember this, you were following exactly what Congress lecturers said, yep. exactly what the U.S. national team said, and you're doing yep. tons and tons of body weight strengthening with high repetition and yep. lifts and rope climbs and chin-ups and cardio circuits. Like you were, you were actually doing a ton of strength. It wasn't like you weren't doing strength. Oh, no. I mean, I definitely had a plan and I was following it. It was just coming from Congress. Exactly. And I yep. think this is where it's so important to realize is that you thought you were doing proper strength, but in reality, we were, as the world is seeing right now, gymnastics specific strength is not enough to keep kids healthy and high level in gymnastics. And so what we did is we added a, a micro dose of normal conditioning with strength conditioning that used weights and kettlebells and barbells and really good planning and, and like off weeks and off days and light and heavy days, not just hard, hard, hard. And for the first two years before I got my um, my postdoctoral work done, we brought in Dave Picardi and everybody else yeah. and the coaches. They came to our gym once a week. Yeah, we, that was went, great. we ended practice 45 minutes early. We got on a bus. We drove to their lifting facility and we yeah. spent an hour there of our practice. And so Derek Groff Derek yeah, Groff was huge. It's really that important for people to realize that. Yeah. Not only did I not have all, I knew a lot, but I didn't have all the information I needed. And so I had a two year mentorship with those guys while I was working out. And so did Mel and so did you. And then only in 2015, when I was done, did I start writing the strength program for our team in the whole gym. So like yeah. very important that people see through what allowed that process. Cause I think if you hadn't had that gut check moment and been like, oh, okay, ego check for me, everybody yeah. around you saw that. I'm like, wow, Eva's willing to on beam no less to say she has work to do and then she's going to ask somebody to do the strength program that she's been doing for 10 years like that's crazy and that gave us the air cover to be like me personally like okay when someone i remember we had a meeting where four of our girls had back problems right and, and we sat down in the office with all four of their moms and you sat me and her down and the, they were like attacking me they were like why do we have all these back injuries like what's yep. going on and i was just like so crushed because like i'm the pt i'm the strength coach i should know 
but your ability to check your ego and swallow your pride and get a gut check and say, hmm, maybe there's something we're missing is mm. what allowed me in that meeting to not explode, right? When I normally would, yeah. and say, okay, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I'm really, and that kind of put me on a cascade of the, the more strength conditioning workload stuff we talked about later. And you know what, Dave, you deserve so much credit. I mean, after that Brenda story and we got you in and we got you hired, it was like in nine months, Brenda's looking at me from across the gym at a meet going, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. You know, like it was like, and, and I know that overall it was, you know, to get the, the program to where it is today, mm. it took all the, you know, all the pieces you just, you just mentioned and all the people been wonderful to us, but you know, you knew immediately what, you know, some in, immediate things that need to be changed sure. and, and bringing it back to, you know, you reminded me how important it is to bring it back to the basics, to bring it back to the shaping yeah. drills for skills. And that, you know, that's really how we build a nice solid foundation for our gymnasts. And, and yeah, I think we've had a good, a good working relationship because we're able to bounce ideas off each other. We're able to, we have that, that level of friendship where we can check each other when it's, <laughs> one of us starts floating over here whoa go, come back come back come back um and yeah so there you know there were definitely dave you walked in with so much energy and i was starting to burn out after kind of trying to overhaul this program and i i needed your energy i needed someone to come in with a fresh perspective um i also needed some strength like mm -hmm. physical strength you know these kids were starting to do more high level bar skills and they were all bigger than me mm. and taller than me and it got to a point where it's like okay this big girl high bar release like ugh, yeah. i i'm gonna get crushed if you miss the bar and i don't i started to get to that point like i'm not sure if i can confidently guide you to the ground properly yeah. if 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 you miss and so so I really, you know, I hate to call you the muscle, but I, I did, I needed, I needed help because there weren't that many high level coaches in the gym mm -hmm. that were spotting the way I was spotting and really kind of like grinding through um, the, the shaping and stuff. And so, so I'm just gonna take a quick second to thank you for your help and for jumping on and and getting the kids into shape and and tag teaming bars with me especially and and so you know I, <laughs> one of my favorite memories from 2013 probably was when you called a meeting with me and said i just have a few things i want to discuss <laughs> i have a few ideas so I don't know, four hours later and six pages of notes um, with lots of bullet points and arrows and chicken scratch. I was like a few things. Okay. So, you know, but it was great. You know, I think that we were ready to implement 25% of what you presented to me that day. You felt like we were ready to implement 90%. And those, that was a tough conversation to have. You know, it was, it was like, I, it was especially tough because I was right there with you, right? I could right. see it. We had the same vision. I knew exactly what you were talking about. I, I was like, yes, we can do this. We can get there. You're already at step 97. The gym is at like step 17. So we're going to have to like climb this ladder and yeah. we have some BS to take care of along the way. <laughs> um, and so, so it was hard because I really appreciated the energy you were bringing to practice every day and to the situation and to the um, innovation and the strategy behind, you know, what we were going to do next and how we were going to implement it. And so the last thing I wanted to do <laughs> was kill that energy because that was so important for us and still is. So it, it was definitely tricky trying to navigate those conversations with you, but, you know, I mean, here we are, so it must have worked out. Um, but 
I think that eventually you got to a point where you're like, okay, yes, we can't bite off more than we can chew. And, oh, I didn't realize that there are 64 other different components that, you know, come together to make this work. And so, you know, I, I remember that before you had come to us, you had spent a lot of time doing summer training because you were in school. So you were training gymnasts um, at USGTC and I know you were working with Svetlana and, and so a lot of skill building. <clears throat> and so I remember, you know, after that summer was over and we got into the meat season, you were like baffled as to why these kids all of a sudden, like just miraculously couldn't throw skills. Like yeah. how, why is it that we worked all summer on this shoot over and now we can't get it in the routine? Why can't we get it in the routine? Well, because they're back in school now and you know, the boyfriend and the stress from the parents and we're missing practices because we need to learn how to plan our time and you know yep. we're gonna study and all these things and um and i just i remember you being so frustrated thinking about feeling like that summer work was was wasted or that it just kind of went nowhere when really it was like no this is just <laughs> how it goes. this is kind of how it goes and then we got into high school gymnastics season Woof. I, oh god do we even yeah, we'll, we'll save oh, that. Sure. I'm sweating. I'm sweating. Yeah, I can. <laughs> I'm sweating. Oh boy. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's, it's such good perspective. And I think looking back now, if I could bucket the summary points of pieces of advice for people who are probably in this now, number one is we had a monstrous shift in accountability for our own personal, the way we behaved around the kids, the actions we took to do things and not say we were going to do things like there was a large do gap between what we said we were going to do and what we didn't do um the other thing we did a, a really big overhaul was our educational system like a lot of staff training a yeah. lot of online videos a lot more paying the coaches yes their time right not like hey coming on a sunday just because coming on a sunday like no you pay people their hourly rate to come in and learn how to get uh, spotting clinics and learn how to yeah. do choreography and learn how to do strength conditioning and stuff like that. So that was really big. But I think we really tackled like three spokes on a wheel. We tackled education and accountability. We tackled everything under the physical preparation bucket, which is strength and cardio and flexibility. Like we used science and experts outside of our gym and small baby changes over the course of a few years. And yeah. then third is I think we really went all the way back to Let's have per perfect basics and perfect fundamentals and really work drills and skills. Take away the five chucking souks, hopefully to your feet, or the let's hope you make it around on your one and a half and don't blow your back apart. And now let's actually do real basics. I think those three things were the majority of the four years that we tackled together. And I think that's what allowed us to get to this part where we are now, which I don't, do you have anything else to say on that middle section before I talk about what we've been doing in the last four years? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a lot of education. I mean, I if I were to pick one word to represent that time period, I would say education. Yeah. Um, and like you said, it was it it was education everywhere. It was let's help the the gymnasts understand why we're doing these drills. Yes. So, and that was a big one because they just wanted to come to the gym and flip and twist and and so they felt like doing drills was going backwards. Mm. That was the mentality. And so we had to really break that mentality to help them understand that actually doing these drills is helping you move forward. So just because you're not flipping and twisting and, and dismounting, it's like there's a process to learning how to do that more efficiently yeah. and to perfect those pieces. And if, and we're not gonna just keep staring at you, giving you the same correction over and over again. Yep. We're going to take this skill and break it out into its smaller pieces. And we're going to train each piece by drilling each piece. When we master the drill, we can take that piece that we've mastered and put it back into the skill mm -hmm. and now miraculously it's easier and they're standing it up or they're making it they're making it work and so but do but we had to be successful doing that a few times 
before the kids could really kind of get on board. Like once they saw it work a few times, then it was like reinforcing the the process. And we kept saying things like, trust your training, trust the process, you know, hate me now, love me later. That was one of my favorites. Um, this will all make sense to you later, I promise. Just <laughs> trust me. And, and I think they were able to get there with us because we had worked so hard on the culture and the communication, the appropriate athlete coach relationships and really making sure that every day it was a a two-way street the communication talk to me what's going on don't just give me this face of misery tell me what's happening so that we can work through it a lot of mental health counseling and and so we built a relationship of trust with our gymnasts and then then when we're saying okay we're going to back this up and do this drill down low before we throw it up high on the beam because they trusted us in other areas yes they were like okay you know then it it don't you feel like it kind of started getting easier to to break things apart and drill each piece and but i think it's really important to connect the dots for them even though even the little guys you know so you know just the other day had them doing just a, a body shaping drill. They were holding a nice hollow shape between two panel mats and then do a quarter turn and hold. Yeah. And, you know, the kids were being kind of blah, blase with it. And it, I was like, this is, this is the most wonderful twisting drill, right? Yeah. You can maintain this shape yeah. while you're doing your double full on floor. Um, it's going to be so pretty. It's yeah. going to be so pretty. It's going to feel so easy. You're going to be flying like you're floating and whoo, light bulbs go off and all of a sudden next thing you know it they're in there doing the drill holding the shape and so connecting the dots for them helping them understand why they're doing what they're doing is so important and connecting it to something you know they're excited about right if you know that you're working with a gymnast who you know loves the thrill of being upside down of flying through the air of flipping and twisting help connect the more basic drill that she may feel is tragically boring to yeah. the thrilling excitement of the skill that they love to do. And then they might be more inclined to actually follow direction and make improvements on it. Yes, very, very well said. Uh, I think one thing I want to highlight before I talk about kind of where we've been the last four years is I think that era was successful because we all had, we all talked about and agreed upon a shared vision and a shared set of morals that we believe yeah. in. Um, and I think that's really important because behavior change very much comes from telling people, painting, asking them, what's the ideal version of your future that you would like to get through, right? We did that a lot with the kids. And for some of them, that was like, I want to go through these levels, whatever they are, and I just want to have an amazing senior speech and I want to move on to college and be so happy when I come home and teach. And we had other people that were like, I would really like to pursue a collegiate level uh, yeah. goal. And so we did a better job of painting the picture of, okay, here's your goal. Here are the things that you are required to be recruited at that level or to be that level of gymnast or to be safe in your senior year when you're doing these hard skills. And then we would step that one back and like, here are all the skills that need to go in those routines and then paint yep. it again here are all the drills and all the times you got to show up for attendance and how you got to manage your time and take care of yourself when you're not here to be able to have energy for practice and then that painted all the way back to like why you have the strength why you have the flexibility mm -hmm. i think for all the coaches being able to align themselves with the behaviors that match to the bigger goals we call them micro and macro goals in our gym yeah. um, i think that was really powerful for us to to get into that next phase of where i think yeah. we and you know the regular coaches meetings i think yeah. were very helpful at that time right. and anytime you and i got together and you know came up with something that we were going to add to the culture you know we made sure to sit with the coaches and help them understand um why we think this is important we brought them into the discussion and just I think I see too many gyms go too long without having those regular um, check-ins. And I think it's really important to help the coaches feel like they're a part of what's going on, that their their opinions are valued and that they have a voice. And if all of your staff feel like they have a voice, mm. then they translate 
that energy to their gymnasts. And now their gymnasts feel like they have a voice. It really does trickle down and, and it helps build a culture of respect and purity, which I think was really important. That was also the, the time frame. if I can add one more thing, where I was looking at the, at the uh, program class level mm-hmm. and discovering that there were really two needs in the community, two different needs. Half of our community was looking for recreational gymnastics. You know, the the kids were fascinated by the, the state of the art equipment and wanted to come in and jump around and um, meet new friends and learn how to do skills and so they could show them off in, in their backyards and things like that, but not necessarily driven toward competitive gymnastics. It was more like, this is recreational. This is a place where I can have fun. I can be physically active. I can meet new people, but definitely more of a recreational mindset. Mm. The other half (laughs) were like, the parents are calling me going, so we come twice a week. Can we add two private lessons on top of that? And is there another class that I can add her to on a Saturday morning? She's, she's four and a half. Oh, Okay. So it was like this split. I mean, it was really dramatically in, in both directions. So I'm like, okay, the they're calling for private lessons. So I'm asking the, the parents these questions, like, are they not getting what, what they need in class? Like, are you feeling like the coach or teacher is missing something? Oh, no, no, we love the teacher. She just wants to be there more often. Yeah. So at that point, I said, okay, we need to develop two different tracks. We need a recreational program and we need a competitive track so we can help these parents see the roadmap. And some parents enroll their kids in gymnastics programming and they just want their kids to be active, maybe without necessarily kicking a ball or, you know, and they don't maybe they don't know what they want out of it for their child and maybe their child is too young to really know what he or she wants out of it. But I think at least showing them visually that, that there are a couple of different tracks, a couple of different directions we can go with this has been really helpful. And it's also allowed us to serve more people in our community because if we're just 100%, you know, competitive focus, it's, not everybody wants competitive gymnastics, but we they can still be a part of this wonderful sport and and go and get so much out of it. So my point is that, you know, kind of revamping the program structure also helped, mm-hmm. you know, kind of filter it into the team culture as well. So that 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 those options, like having options was kind of became the new normal. And it was like, you know, if you, if you don't really care about college gymnastics, that's okay. We just need to know so that, so that we're not pushing you in that direction if that's not what you want. And so really kind of starting back from the ground up was really important, I think. Um, And it kind of just trickled up into the team program. So, that summarizes that period really well. Um, and I think we moved into the, the 2016 to 2021. Oh man, the last five years have been the hardest because we obviously had the scandal. We had the entire abuse scandal break. I was very involved with many colleges and I was traveling to other countries to starting to speak. And I will be very honest and I've never really said this on the podcast, but like that, time period of, of the last those two years eight, 16 to 18 and even 19 were so hard man they weighed heavy on me very very hard and i think one of the reasons it was so hard was because i was doing so much work i was working too much um but also we were so shook by what happened to us we all realized that we really wanted to become an example of what can happen when you do things correctly and i you and i are deeply empathetic and we had so much pain in our heart for everything that was happening but I was furious, man. I was so mad for so long about changing it. And I think that triggered us to have really the big change for us in 16 onward and why we've gotten to where I think we are now, which is something I'm very proud of. 
is we instated a radical transparency and communication policy, like to the point where, and we got this from Val, anyone is allowed to tell each other something as long as it's honest and professional, right? Or honest and respectful. And I remember the girls wrote me and Mel, the other coach I coach with, um, a letter that was like a page and a half long and it outlined all of the things that they were worried about for us that we were doing because we were so stressed out and we were so overwhelmed and we were bringing our own personal life into the gym in terms of not dumping our problems on them, but we were really frustrated with them. And like they could see that we were bubbling at the cracks with our own personal frustration with the situation in the gymnastics world, but also yeah. that they felt as though we were starting to play favorites. They felt that we were getting mad at them for no reasons. They felt we were attacking them as humans and not as people. Like we were starting to slide back downhill into like that dictatorship type coaching that I am so disgusted with myself that I ever had that to begin with. But we have entered a period now where we really wanted to become something that was so gold standard for what we believe in, what makes the coaches happy, the parents happy. And I think after five years, we're finally to somewhere we're really proud of. But I, I think the biggest thing we did was really have like the most uncomfortable, painful conversations with each other, with ourselves and between our, our different areas of the gym rec team, whatever it is. And that revealed some seriously large gaps in what we needed to improve upon. So I wanna share what we did in this last five years and then kind of dive into how do we deal, deal with parents or coaches, whatever. But I don't know, what are your thoughts on that time period too? Because I remember that was, <sighs> that was, 18 was so hard. You know, it's, it's hard, it's hard to talk about. Um, I felt like we were stuck. I felt really stuck. I was, you know, I felt like we were stuck. We were tired. We were unfocused. Um, you know, it was like we were already kind of dealing with everything else that felt so hard and being so, so tragically heartbroken when all these abuse scandals came to light. And I, and just thinking about the survivors and what they have been through, it was just, it's just, it still is, it's just devastating. And I think it, it has been, you know, exhausting, just, it's just been exhausting. And then, you know, feeling like powerless, like, like, I know you and I were both in this space where it was like, we just want to, like, what can we do? We want to something you know we want to change something how do we how do we save this world right now <laughs> and so you know everything just got kind of fuzzy and jumbled and we were kind of like like ping pong balls just kind of bouncing all over the place trying to figure it out and we kind of lost our moral compass for a mm. second I and that. i have to credit miss val because i'm her number one fan I know she has a lot of fans, mm -hmm. but you know, her book came out and I actually listened to it because I was in a time in my life where I, I couldn't really sit down and read with a one-year-old baby. So I was listening to her book in, um, in transit and it just, I'm glad I listened to it because her voice is so, powerful and inspiring. And I just, listening to her helped me kind of realize that our moral compass was a little bit off and that we needed to take a breath and <laughs> reevaluate and drop the anchor again and go, okay, hold on, let's go back to our roots here. Let's go, let's refocus. Let's go back to the core of what we do and why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think it's really important that anytime, you know, there are tough decisions to be made or tough situations to, to move through, that we, we come back to those core values. You know, why are we here? What are we doing? Yeah. And, and if you come back to those, those, those core foundational pieces that are who you are as a person, are who you are as a program, then, then all of a sudden it's not so hard to make a decision mm -hmm. at least. Yep. Uh, maybe taking action on the decision is difficult, but mm -hmm. at least you know that the decision is coming from mm -hmm. the right place. And so thank you, Ms. Val, for, 
for helping us back to that space. Um, mm -hmm. It was really necessary. And so it, it's, it, it was tricky and it, and it continues, it continues to be tough. But I think that, that the letter you just referenced coming from the gymnast was like a giant brick off, off the forehead. And it was a little bit like, Ooh, okay, <laughs> we got to wake up now. Like what's going on? That was a nice wake up call. And I was so proud of us of our gymnasts mm. because, you know, although it was hard to read the words in that letter, I, I was reminded that the work we had done up to that point was worth it Yes, because they felt like they had enough of a voice to write a letter and actually give it to us. Mm -hmm. And then they even came to practice that night too. They they didn't even avoid. Yeah, it wasn't <laughs> like you know. yeah exactly. So, um, yeah. and that's so, that's something that we and I, we still do every not a letter, but we have um, again for practical takeaways. Before there were there are five things that I wrote down that I think we changed quite a bit after this situation. This letter, but we still have at the end of every meet season, we have a like an almost a debrief where every coach coaching group so i work with three other coaches we sit down with our you know seven to whatever um seven to 20 gymnasts that we have on our optional levels and we just ask openly what went well what didn't go well what do you want to see changed what are we doing good bad and it's not a tra uh, it's not a trash fest people some people really say like things they really enjoyed this was better let's keep doing this like some of them being like we love the strength is really hard and the, and the practices are really hard but we love them because we're a group together and seeing progress and I'm getting new releases or I'm getting a new beam series. And so we do that every year. And then you and I have a four hour sit down with a top of the bird's eye view, but then you also host a coaches meeting where we all have this, like, just lay it to me straight. Tell me good, bad, ugly. And it's usually followed by some extracurricular activities so we can debrief and enjoy each other's company socially, but we have a really hard meeting. And I think it's amazing. The credit to the staff that you've built and the amazing people we work with is, Aside from like one or two people who I think have, we've decided it's not a good fit and you've taken the courageous effort to say like, hey, I think it's time to, to move on or find a different position. 98% of the people that we work with don't get defensive and they are open to it and they really take it with a grain of salt professionally to try to change about what's better for the gym, what's better for all of us, how can we all be happier? So doing that every year, but then at the, the middle of the year, no, sorry, at the same time we do a group meeting, we also plan 15 minute individual meetings with every single gymnast and mel and i sit down and we say do you still love gymnastics are you happy have your goals changed do you do you want something different and sometimes people are like no i'm doing great school's good you know i'm tired sometimes i'm frustrated but overall i feel good and other times as we've had recently in the last six months people are like you know what i think i'm ready to be done i think I'm, i love gymnastics but i need to focus on school i want to do another sport. Um, I don't really want to go level nine, 10 anymore. I want to just, you know, ride out this fun thing and make it be what it is. And sometimes having those, those conversations, it's really hard to ask those questions because you're scared of the answer sometimes. Yeah. Um, but having those individual meetings, having that longer meeting, and then halfway through the year, we have a quick touch base about, Hey, still good. Everything fine. All right, great. I think us installing that policy or installing that policy has been the biggest reason why we've made progress the last five years. I think so too. And, and I think it's so important. And when you're regularly touching base with them, then it, you know, the more you do it, the easier it gets and the less afraid you are of the answer, <laughs> the answers that you're going to get. You know, I think that it's, it's really hard to separate, you know, as a coach, it's really hard to separate yourself from what you know the gymnast is capable of and what you want for her or him and what they think they're capable of and what they want themselves. And so finding that distinction or even being able to identify them as the same or different mm. is a good step in helping to stay on the same page with your gymnast. I think yeah. that uh, how many times have we pushed, 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 pushed because we know she is so talented and she's so capable and she's so coachable. And then all of a sudden 
she starts to grumble and she starts not showing up and then she's in tears at practice because we moved the chalk bucket, like just something so silly. And it's like, what is it? What's happening? What's happening all of a sudden? Like what happened here? And um, well, so well, what happened? I, and then come to find out it's, you know, she's feeling the pressure and she's feeling pressure because what, what we, you know, our goals for her are so different than her own goals for herself. So it's so important to make sure that you're on the same page with your gymnast, that the goals are aligned and that you're helping your gymnast yeah. through the process of achieving her goals yeah. or his goals. Yeah. If you don't have these conversations with them and their parents, sometimes you got to bring the parents in. What are we doing? Yeah. You know, it's just a lot of running against the wall over and over again. And then when, when they get injured or burn out or just quit altogether, it is devastating. And it's like, you can save yourself from some of that devastation if you just simply communicate on a regular basis yeah. and you're open-minded and willing to hear another view. Point. I mean, I've been shocked at other, at, at gymnast goals before. I've been shocked. Really? Yeah. You want to do what? You know, and, and, and sometimes it can be as simple as, <laughs> you're going to laugh at this one. So we've been training your Chenko vault for five years, but you want to souk? Like, what have we been doing for so long? I don't understand. And yeah. it's like, okay, so we can't think of that work to build the Yurchenko <laughs> is wasted. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that maybe we could have maybe asked, asked the question, do you even like this vault? Like, do you even want to do this vault? Because if they don't want to do the vault, yeah. maybe we should reconsider other options. I agree. I agree. And uh, I think if we kind of dive into maybe how we, tackled like individual chunks. Uh, I think it's there's five things that I was brainstorming when I look back about what really solidified this change for us and which I think made a lot of the coaches happier and much of the gymnasts happier is one is we clearly identified our priority filter, which is number one, health, number two, build great humans, number three, build great gymnasts in that order all the time, no matter what. Right. And I think we sometimes flip those numbers around if we were being if not intentionally, but we just lost track of our moral compass, like yeah. you said. So we now make every decision through that lens and we try to teach the coaches and the parents and the kids to make that decision that way. Is this best for my health? Okay. Does this involve you being a good human? And then now does this involve me becoming a great gymnast? So that's number one. Two is we built our stoplight system for skill move ups, which I think is in short term and we can another podcast we can dive into this. But essentially instead of just subjectively weighing if somebody was ready to move to the next level or not, we made a very you know line in the sand criteria about here are the level requirements for level eight, level nine, level 10. Um, and here's green light is we've seen you do this five times consistently on multiple days and you're ready to go for these skills, these requirements. Um, yellow light is like you need a spot or it's in the, it's on a soft mat. It's not quite ready, but you're getting there. And then red light is like, uh, we need more work on this. It still has some room to go and uh, it's not without a spot independently on multiple days. But we also factored in attendance. You know, have you been here for 90% of your practices? Um, not because we think you, you know, need to be here at a certain hour or whatever, but like this shows commitment to your your time management skills and school and whatever else it is. But then also we also had, you know, objective measures on scores too. Like, did you get an average 8.6-ish on each event three times? Uh, and an all around score that reflects that because that's not like we're looking at the number as it matters because we know sometimes the meets go crazy, but like that just shows consistency. You're able to do it in multiple gyms across different situations on different days. And I think yeah. that was very important for us as we over communicated with the parents and the kids twice a year, we would give them literally a sheet of paper with all these requirements and we would mark them with green, yellow, red and explain to them this is good. This is not and the kids are like, Oh yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. My series is kind of funky sometimes. They're like, I'm crushing it on ball and floor, but like, I know I need to work on bars. And I think that was really good because the parents were no longer blindsided for me. Move yeah, ups. That um, was huge. I think the third thing is we agreed morally to do more YMCA and intra squad meets at our gym and less mm -hmm. club meets because we, 
as coaches leading kids didn't agree with the behaviors that were being demonstrated by other parents and coaches at those meets. And it was transforming us. It was molding us into something we were not proud of in terms of our parents started to say some more things in the stands that we were like, what? Like, like that's not who we believe in. And I remember in, like rotating with some amazing gyms and amazing squads and the meet went so well and so perfect. We set each other's bars and it was great. Like they were supportive. We were supportive. But then other meets were like, we were uncomfortable with the squad we were rotating with because of how they were talking to their kids. And our girls were looking around like, what the, <laughs> who in the world talks like that? You're an adult, like a fucker kid like that. And the girl would just cry. Right. So we're and like, then the oh. next week in practice was great. Cause yeah. they, they had a whole new appreciation for us <laughs> after seeing the way the other teams were being treated. Yeah. Anyway, sorry to cut you off. No, 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 you're fine. Um, so yeah, we, we just uh, thought we were going to do more of our own meets in our YMCA where it's a little bit more value-based. Uh, yeah. I think the fourth biggest thing that we did, and this is a big overhaul now, is it was uh, time mandatory time off after the meet season. Yeah. It was a longer preseason. It was less meets over less months with higher quality hours over quantity. Like, hey, when we're here, we're on, we're working hard, we're going for it, but we're off, we're off. We're not going to stand around for four and a half hours and look at each other and get stuff done and have you be miserable because you're not really sleeping at night. So we kind of pulled back our goal age of level nine and above for college goals and stuff like that. It, we used to try to get that by high school and we we're like, let's go, let's shoot for sophomore, junior year. Yeah. And then lastly, I think you and I were very firm on this with the parents. It was so hard to swallow, but we had a no, we started in a no tolerance policy for injuries and in kids competing. If you couldn't do it seven times, the two weeks before a meet on hard with no spot yeah. by yourself, it wasn't even a question of whether you were competing the skill at the meet. And the kids started to learn that. The parents started to learn that, like, right, I need to do seven Yurchenko pike layouts on hard without Dave near or without Eva near me. If I even want to ask the question, should I do this at the meet? And we used to have, like, the Thursday before the meet, like, if I do one now, can I do it? And we used to let that slide. And kids oh, would cross their ankles. But now awesome. we're, like, it's so part of our culture that like, did you do your seven? Were you here every day the last two weeks before the meet, except for the illness yeah. or thing? And the parents, I think, have gotten much more respectful of that because they know yeah. the kids are safe. So those were five tactical things I really wanted to highlight that I think people should yeah. try to maintain the conversation on. And when we implemented the the seven, the rule of seven, mm. um, we met with the parents and the kids at the same time right. so that they were all getting the same message um what what we never want to do is assume that the kids are communicating <laughs> with their parents the way that we're communicating to them and so and and then and vice versa you know if we're if we're communicating through email or in parent meetings to the parents directly we can't assume that they're telling their athletes all the details and so it's like playing telephone things get lost in translation and so i thought that that was really helpful having them all in the same room uh, so that they hear the same message there's no questions everyone heard the same thing yep. um and it made it much easier to go into that season and but really the key is consistency i mean you have to be consistent oh. you have to be consistent and you have to stand by your word even when it's hard Yep, absolutely. You have to do it. And that's part of what builds, you know, not only the culture and the loyalty, but it it helps, you know, if if safety first is non-negotiable, which it should always be. You know, it these these smaller decisions feed into that bigger picture. And you build culture and loyalty you know, every time you stick to your guns and you stick, to stand behind your word, mm. you know, not only is it impacting the athlete that it relates to in that moment, but all of her or his teammates are watching, mm. right? Mm. And so now you're reinforcing it for everyone else on the team. Yep. So if, if we say, okay, you have to you have to throw your seven to hard before before you can compete it in front of a judge, and we're letting someone get off with five, mm, right? You better believe the rest of the team knows. And we that had against us. Remember that we used to have kids who'd be like, well, like Susie Salto well, gets to do it five. Yep. Let her mm -hmm. compete. Oh God, dear, I knew yep. I'd done that. <laughs> 
and yep. they don't they don't miss a thing. But you know, every time they they see that you're consistently following through with the policies that have been put in place, mm-hmm. whether it applies to them or not, it builds and you know puts another block of respect on the tower. And so, um, and the same goes for the parents. You know, the parents might know that. Susie Salto only did five. And and so when they're at the meet, they see that she's not competing the vault or whatever it is. They're like, oh, okay. So that huh. that meeting that we had at the beginning of the season actually meant something and they're actually following through with it. And so. Do you, do you remember, and then I wanna definitely spend the last half hour on these points, but do you remember the first time we really put our foot down on the, uh, if you don't have giants or a safe you know, attempt at giants well, you're going to scratch because your your start value is low and you don't have not even like it's like your basic requirements you don't have for like level seven or whatever it was moving up and we had four out of seven kids scratch at a meet and we stood there and just took l after l after l for four kids to scratch and people were like damn at really multiple did. meets yes for like three meets yeah. in a row yes and so, until people were safe enough to do it and then we went to meets down the road and pe- like a lot of people had really high quality giants and they weren't banana bending over the bar and it wasn't a scary hope they don't peel and like i remember just standing under that low bar and we were like oh my like i feel lasers in the back of my head from the parents just staring at me and everybody else in the meeting i was like nope stick to your values we agreed on this everybody agreed on this and we're just gonna take on chin and then and even sure. the other teams yes. who knew us well and knew that like if she just does something and gets a four, they're still gonna they're gonna win, right? Yep. So we were like choosing second or third place, yeah. <laughs> um, and but we were choosing it because it was the right thing to do. The value that we, the return on investment we got from the kids and our yep. value and the parents of trust buy in for those three painful meets were enormous, huge, yep. and yep. and it was painful. I mean, yep. it was <laughs> so, so painful. Uh, so in the last half hour, I would like to kind of dump, uh, dive into the little like pockets of things that are very common questions that we have advice for. So maybe I'll bring up the topic and I'll give you my two cents and I'd like to hear your two cents because there's a lot of different things I think people are dealing with. So one is you led the question perfectly was like enforcement of policy is really like new policy. We really worked hard and it took us a long painstaking process to actually put our foot down where we said we were going to do it. Right. And so we talked about a few already, but for me, it was uh not walking away from uncomfortable conversations when somebody was being disrespectful or was not doing the assignment or uh was showing up late really and i had i used to ignore those conversations because i hated conflict and now i've been able to grow myself but for you i think it was no sitting no more cell phones allowed at practice like coaches and kids put their their phones in a basket right like you get here on time right and i think the big one that we had and i was guilty of this was the staff would start to gossip and just congregate in this small little circle during warmups or during strength. And we would all be talking amongst ourselves while the kids were doing their thing. And I remember like, that was really hard. We had to, you had to let people go. You, we had parents that left the gym. We had kids that didn't want to go anymore because we were like, no, our values are good humans, then good gymnastics. And some people weren't okay with that. So I guess, what is your advice to people who are going through that? Cause a lot of people are going to be going through this, like, is this a good fit for me? Should I stay? Like as an employer, like I want to raise this concern to my boss, but I'm worried they're not going to hear it. Like all that kind of jazz. The best thing you can do is raise the concern to your boss. And I think if it's done in a professional, well worded way, you know, be prepared when you go in and make sure that if you're having a conversation with your boss about something that you're seeing that doesn't that doesn't seem right um that that you're prepared for the conversation that it's that that you you show up with potential solutions because i think that if if you're presenting something to your leader and you're making it known that it is that you're having this conversation because you love and respect the gym and the kids and the space and and you want to to do your part to help make it better and you're seeing that this is happening and and so maybe we can come up with with some options you know like i'm thinking maybe one of the options could be mm. x y and z then as the leader you know the leader might not hear that as a complaint 
right? And then feel the need to get defensive. So I think sometimes what happens, you know, it really in, in any business is there's a lot of rah, 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 squawk, 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 talk, talk, talk. And so someone who has been sitting in a leadership position for a while, it's like, you know, the staff come in and it's like, oh, are we just venting today? Or, you know, are we just complaining? Is everything just frustrating? Because, you know, it, it, it it wears you down after a while when it's constant and it's all day long. So if you think about where the leader's coming from, right? And and how he or she thinks and how he or she processes information, be prepared, go in with a plan, go in with a concern. And even if you have to write a little, a little script or a couple of um, notes in your notebook to keep yourself on track and uh, you know, from going down any kind of scary rabbit holes. I think that that will, that helps, right? It's all about the presentation. It's all about, it's all about having a conversation and starting with your ultimate goal, right? So if your ultimate, like, like, hey boss, my ultimate goal is for this to be a place where everyone loves to come to work and people look forward to doing whatever they were leaving, whatever they were doing to come here and coach these kids. Yep. Unfortunately, right now, I feel like the vibe is a little ugh, icky or the culture is a little shaky. And, and I want to, I want to help, but you can't end there, right? You have to, you have to, you have to continue with some ideas. Maybe we could do this. Let's try that. I've heard that maybe this works. Um, and if it's presented in a way that doesn't make the leader feel like he or she is doing the wrong thing or has epically failed at running the gym, then then the leader might be more apt to listen and yep. make a change. Yeah, I agree. And I um, the other piece that I'll add in before I wanna move on to the coaching part of this is I think it's really, we both read we share a lot of books. We both read Extreme Ownership by Jocko mm -hmm. Wilkins around this book. We, we both started to lead conversations about problems in the gym with, here's the issue and here's my role and what I think I've done wrong and what I need to take yeah. a better stock of, right? So we were no longer kicking the door in, literally, probably to your office, um, and being like, you're doing this wrong and this coach is doing this. I hate his parents always like this and this kid's lazy. Like it wasn't this. Uh, assault of everybody else, we would always start a conversation with, all right, I see this problem. It's a trend. Yeah. And here's what I think I'm doing wrong. I'm trying to work on this. But at the same time, here are some things that I feel also need to be with other people. Um, or respectfully, I think maybe your leadership could, could tweak something right here. The other thing that's really yeah. important about just said this on a, a webinar I watched last night was strength in numbers is very important. I think if you're the only person who is saying there's a problem i think it's very hard sometimes to get traction against that but if you can get a bunch of coaches together who you agree that you know this policy needs to change or this person's behaviors are maybe bringing the vibe down and you guys can all say like hey all of us have talked and agreed that like we really think this issue is is, is a problem whether it's like people being late or like uh, a parent who's really gossiping quite a bit or one coach who's maybe not using the safest training tactics based on what we know now. I think mm -hmm. we should all address this in a professional meeting. It's all again, shared vision of like, how do we get to our end goal of happy, healthy, high performing athletes that are safe and enjoying the gym and we're happy at work without feeling like we have to, you know, rip each other's hair out with gossip. Right. Yeah. And again, you know, like I mentioned before, in those moments, if you bring it back to the core values, right? So I just feel like the, you know, one of our major core values here at the Y is respect. And so I just feel like the kids are being so disrespectful to each other, you know, or, or even gymnasts to coach. Like these gymnasts are just being so disrespectful. You know, I don't know why they're fighting me. Um, it's my job to, teach them how to do gymnastics i'm not going to beg them to do gymnastics this is an extracurricular activity they're driving me batshit crazy and i i'm just done you know it's like okay then let's bring it back to the gymnasts and the whole group of coaching staff and say okay let's not forget that this is we are a ymca organization yep what i love about the why 
is that we welcome all. And our core values are caring, honesty, respect, and responsibility. So are we respecting every, you know, each other right now? Are we respecting, are we caring for each other right now? Is this, is this responsible? You know, it's like when you already have those core values in place, they're easy to come back to. Yes. And when you're having constant conversations with your staff and your gymnasts and your parents and your other um, employees who maybe aren't coaching but are very involved in the program, like administrators and things, it's like all you sometimes all you have to do is say, are, is this a responsible decision? You know, are we are are we caring for each other if we're doing this? Snaps them out of it, you know. And sometimes it's that easy. It sometimes it's not, but at least it's it's a reminder. It's like if you're going to be a part of this team, part of what you're signing off on when you sign our handbook contract is that you're going to live by our core values and our mission while you're here and hopefully outside of the gym, but definitely while you're here. And so in terms of, you know, holding people accountable, regardless of their position in, in the program, it's like you, again, I, um, unfortunately, I have to apply this consequence or I have to write you up, right? Because, because you made this comment, it was, it was disrespectful. And one of our core values is respect. You're violating that. And so I'm going to write you up and let's have a conversation about what, why this happened, help me understand what's going on for you so that you're getting to this level of frustration where these things are coming out of your mouth. You know, do you need a day off? <laughs> That's usually my first go-to, like maybe a couple days off. Go go spend some time with your family. Go spend some time, you know, have you been working too much? What's going on outside of the gym? Is there something you need to take care of? Is there something you need help with? But let's create a plan to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Or if you feel like you're getting to that point, before you get there, come and talk to me because yeah, yeah. then I can give you a day off before something nasty comes out of your mouth or we can kind of talk it through and I can go help have the conversation with the athlete. Yeah. So I think sometimes, you know, staff especially get to a boiling point and they're like up to their eyeballs in frustration and you know as the leader it's incredibly frustrating when the first time i'm hearing about something <laughs> when they're exploding yes. with with anger and it's like well you know for the past few weeks and i'm like that's the worst thing you can say to me <laughs> yeah and i'm like where where were you three weeks ago if this has been going on for the past three weeks why have you not been in this office talking to me so you know you have this conversation with your employees at least at least once and then hopefully it's like the, hopefully they remember like okay last time i got to my boiling point yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was upset that i didn't talk to her earlier so now i'm almost there i should probably go talk to her and it's not just about that it's about the fact that you know I, i've been in this game a long time i can help you just yeah. give yeah. me the opportunity yeah. Yeah. and yeah, I think to summarize on the policy change point is there's always kind of three levels of, of in um, I guess, change that you can kind of attack or three levels to kind of figure out where to start. And one is talk with the person directly about who you maybe have a concern with or issue with. And I think that Absolutely. is common sense but not common practice about, okay, are you talking behind this coach's back? Are you gossiping about this parent and not actually pulling them aside, not in the middle of the gym, not during a busy time, but like sitting down for 10 minutes like, hey, listen, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? Are you having that one-on-one -on -one interaction? And have that interaction first. If that doesn't succeed in behavior change, then move up to the employer or team head coach or empl gym employer level and say, hey, I tried to have a conversation with this person. It, like, it was really defensive. It fell on deaf ears. Even though I tried to be an active listener, I tried to admit what I was doing wrong. Yeah. Can you help me with this? And if that doesn't go well, and you start getting to the level of the entire gym and nobody wants to change, it's the honest, brutal answer. But you have to ask yourself, is this a good fit for me? Is this good? Is this worth my mental, yeah. my emotional health to stay in this culture that I don't agree with, 
Or is it time to move on to another gym or do something else or move on to another role in my life? Like I think people don't want to have that conversation because they're scared of the no, it's not a good fit. And I've been allowing myself to, to corrosively erode in this toxic culture because these people just aren't willing and ready to change. They're not willing and able to change like we said. So start the conversation local, then go to your, your team head coach, then go to your gym owner. If you get all the way through four layers, this might not be a good fit and it's time to move on. And I, I moved on from, from gyms that I was maybe – you know, a part of it and weren't proud of. And I know you have too. So that would be my parting recommendation on this. And in some cases there are, there aren't even four layers, right? You know, I mean, this is, this is a YMCA. This is an organization where the layers keep going all the way up to the Y of the USA. Right. And so um, you can keep making your way up the the chain until someone calls you back or someone, someone listens. Um, And, and, and I love that about this, about our um, structure, but not every gymnastics program is in that situation. Like maybe the person you're going to is the, is the head coach and also the owner and also, (laughs) and so, you know, I think that, that, you know, you can use the three strikes you're out rule. Um, You know, if you've brought something to your leader's attention three times in, in a professional way, maybe, maybe you've even stated it in three different ways. Maybe you've tried a couple times in person. Maybe you've sent an email on top of that. Um, maybe you've picked up the phone, and still, maybe there's a response, but no active change happening. Sure. Then, like you said, that's that's the time to really look in the mirror and say, Ugh, "Like I love these kids, I love my coworkers, but maybe it's time to move on," and that's okay. Um, it's if it's not a great fit for you, and then, and you're not in a position to to be able to make dramatic change, you know, quickly all at once, then then go somewhere else. It's okay. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll find a new group of kids (laughs) that you will coach and, and learn to love and a new group of coworkers. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, if that's anyone's. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there's, I mean, there's the last ones I want to cover are, continue this little point on coaches because we're halfway there with this then i'll talk about like gymnast parents and struggles there but i think for the coaches too summarizing what we're talking about which is like i just get so many messages like i'm trying to change but nobody else is and like mm-hmm. you know i'm trying so hard my boss won't listen people won't listen they're stuck in their old ways they do what they always did they don't want to mm-hmm. hear it. They don't want to so we've talked about how to go about change layers but the, on the positive side i think one of the best things that you kind of created and instilled is we do much more team cohesion bonding stuff outside the gym we're going out to grab dinner we're trying to hang out we're having a staff christmas party or a holiday party and i think what that has allowed us to do is we have like a another great book is called team of teams which is where it talks about these different silos of here's my rec staff here's my optional staff here's my compulsory staff and you guys interact and casual like hey how are you how was your weekend good but you don't really mix you don't really mingle it's usually like a very siloed approach and so i feel like us having more outside the gym activities where we get together and, and the why or you pay for a dinner for everybody and we go out and we hang out allows yeah. us to mix and mingle and like I, I like talked with the rec staff I remember the preschool staff at one of the meetings like one of the longer meetings and I was like oh man I haven't caught up with you in forever and this is awesome but like yeah. we have meetings that are great we have you know dinners that are out and I think that really helped a lot to kind of yeah bring the morale up quite a bit so that was yeah, my definitely. Off that Food, it brings people together. The Italian in you, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's move on then to, I think we're right next door to the gymnastics conversation. Then we'll go parents and business and we'll wrap things up. But I think I remember, man, when we started changing our policy, especially in the 2016, 17 era, about really trying to make it a highly, highly variable program where we could give people the high school gymnastics, other sports route. We could give people the recreational gymnastics fun route. We could give people the high level college goals route. There was so much resistance and pushback from the gymnasts because I think they had, and when you are thinking way back to the first time on, they were like floating along with the minimum amount of work needed to get their goals, quote unquote, to move up. And then it became like, dude, practices got hard. And I remember like, we really were like, because we were worried about safety. We were worried about, okay, you're saying you want level nine, 10 college gymnastics and you want to do that, or you want to do track and field and high school gymnastics and do this. And like, you have to be fit. You have to be healthy. You have to be long to do this. And so we started doing like really hard strength and really hard bar assignments and beam assignments. And I remember that like the 
pushback was real. And I think we did swing the pendulum too hard and we came back with like that yeah. letter. And stuff. But still, it was tough, man. We were going hard 18, 21 mm-hmm. hours that wanted it. And I remember it was so much pushback. But my two cents and what I think helped our gymnast so much, you already said it a little bit, was uh, painting the picture of their goals and making sure it's in alignment. But I think we started our our family rules or our family yeah. guidance, which yeah. is we sat down with the team, like our own little silo. Mm-hmm. Our team. I sat with the optional people and Mel and our other coaches, the compulsory kids sat with them. And we made a, like a, an undertone cultural family guidelines about like, what do we believe in? What's valuable to us? It was like, ego is the enemy. Like we always, uh, we, we value attitude and effort more than scores. That was a big one. Yes. We, um, health, health, good humans, good gymnasts priority was on that list. Like yeah. we made our, a list of all the things we believe in and that was our way to point towards those rules as, hey, you're floating away from what we all agreed upon as a team. We all signed it and we all put it up every year. They change. But it was blending in what you taught me and was so important for me was to critique the behavior and not the human, which I think yeah. is a massive problem in the gymnastics world right now is much of the abuse line gets blurred when you start attacking the human or the gymnast, yeah. creating them versus their behavior. And that allowed us to be like, hey, rule four, right? Remember? Uh, attitude and effort like your behavior right now is you're being very disrespectful when you're talking between your turns and not doing the drills we asked or you're just casually going through the motions on the strength when I stayed up all night to write this strength program and like I'm here dying doing it with you and we agreed upon this so I think that's Mm -hmm. my perception of how we helped work with the gymnast more but I'm curious about what you did or you recommend for those people that are maybe dealing with motivation and sassy issues Mm -hmm. yeah I think I think it's important to notice out loud. Mm. So for instance, if you're watching a floor routine and um, the choreography is just kind of like, you know, kind of sluggish, uh, you know, instead of saying you're sluggish, your chore- like your choreography is not where it needs to be, right? I mean, that would put me in a, in a defensive state Instead, you could say something to the tone of, you know, it looks like you're bored with this choreography. Or it looks like you don't really care about this routine right now. Or, you know, I guess that would be something more, you know, performance related um, as opposed to behavioral. I think for for the behavioral pieces, I also use the three strikes rule. So my first approach, if someone's being sassy, is to go straight to the gymnast and say, are you okay, honey? You know, you okay? Tough day, what's going on? Mm -hmm. I open the door for them. I give them an opportunity to talk to me about why they're behaving this way because there is always a reason for behavior, always. So by approaching them in a non-threatening manner and saying, are you okay? Even if the sass was towards me, because what that does is it kind of breaks down whatever wall or it can break down whatever wall um, they've thrown up. And usually the sassy remarks are, are just that it's, it's, it's the force, it's the force field that they're throwing up. Like they're trying to just separate themselves from you for some reason. Um, the, okay. So let's, let's say I've had, I've asked that question and the answer is I'm fine. I'm good. Or a whole host of other options that they could say back. Um, <laughs> so, you know, if if the SAS comes back the, the second time, that's when I will say, okay, so I'm noticing that your attitude is um, less than awesome today. And I'm not sure what it's all about because I've asked you what it's about and you haven't told me anything. But what I can tell you is that we can't have that kind of attitude today in practice. Okay. So I'm going to give you two options. You can either change your tone and hit the reset button and rejoin us with a new attitude, or you can go home. 
So think about it. I'll be back in two minutes and you let me know in two minutes what you've decided to do. And then I turn around and walk away. So now the ball is in their court. Yep. They've been given an option. They can change the behavior and rejoin practice or they can go home because you know what? Sometimes you just got to go home and eat dinner and go to bed, right? <laughs> Coaches too. And I've had gymnasts choose that option. Yeah. Literally, I have had gymnasts choose. I, 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 one of my, one of my um, gymnasts from 2015. I'm not going to say her name because she'd kill me, but um, I, I adore her. She looked at me um, when she was given this option at one time and said, "I think I just need to go home." Okay, yep. honey. You know, I'm giving her a hug. I'll see you tomorrow. You know, it's like, yeah. thank you for being honest. I gave you the option. It, it was a real option. And um, and I picked up the phone. I called her mom. I said, you know what? She's just having a rough day. I just don't think it's a good day for to, to be doing gymnastics. So I gave her the option to go home early and she took it. So she's on her way. She could drive. She's on her way. And of course, the mom was like, what did she say? What did she do? And you know what? I didn't even get into it. I was just like, I think she just needs a big bowl of pasta in her bed and she'll be fine. <laughs> and so like, we'll talk. I'll see her tomorrow. It, tomorrow's a new day. It's a clean slate. It's all good. Yep. Strike three is a very different tone, right? So if if the attitude comes back, like I've already, I've already asked you what's going on. If you've had a rough day, I've already given you the options, right? I come back and you're still sassing me and giving me a hard time. I say, this behavior is unacceptable. We're not going to allow this behavior in the gym today. We have not allowed it before and we're not gonna allow it tomorrow. It's part of our family rules to be respectful and caring and responsible and honest. You are none of those things right now, okay? So I'm calling your mom, dad, whoever, um, and they're gonna come pick you up, you're gonna go home. And so, and but before they leave, I always tell them that tomorrow is a new day. Tomorrow mm -hmm. is a clean slate or your next practice, right? Because I need them to understand that I'm not holding grudges. Yes. Everyone's entitled to a bad day. And if and when you come back, I we're not we don't even have to talk about it if we don't if you don't want to, right? And so yeah, so sometimes I, you know, they come back and they give me their sorry note that is adorable with little pictures on it. And um, and sometimes it's just kind of like an unspoken look or a but they're always looking. They're always looking to see what my reaction is going to be when they walk in the door the next day. Yeah. And I make it a point to greet them the way I would any other day. Yep. Um, and as soon as I do that, you know, they they light back up and they can jump into warm up and and we can move on. Yep. And so, you know, if if the behavior is is really, really, really terrible mm. and it goes on and on and on for you know, like if this is constantly, we're constantly going through this three-step process week after week after week, you know, it's, I don't even let it get that far. You know, if a month goes by and I feel like I've had too many of these three strikes conversations with them, then it's like, okay, can you come to practice a little early tomorrow? I just want to chat. Yep. Because there's something deeper. Because it seems like you're unhappy. Yeah. And so I think it's all about, again, it's all about the word, the words you're using. It's, it's a very different comment with a very different meaning to say, you're disgusting. I can't believe you're talking to me like this. That's abusive. That's not okay. You've crossed the line. Now, I would even argue these days is that to say your behavior is disgusting is also pushing it right yep. absolutely but but you know at least saying your behavior is this you're pointing out the behavior people can change their behavior yep 
people can't change who they are necessarily, right? So when you're directing it to them specifically, it's offensive. And so you have to be careful that line. It's a very important line. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think you've said so many things. Well, I don't want to belabor the point, but something I think we're really firm on that we changed quite a bit is everything is a choice. You don't, you don't have to do strength. You don't have to do routines. You don't have to come. You don't have to do whatever. Like we, you make your decisions. That's fine. But what we always try to say is you don't have to do anything, but you do have to deal with the consequences of your actions, good or bad. Because consequences are always a negative thing in a negative tone, but there are positive consequences, right? You show up, you work hard, you have a good attitude. When the meat goes well and you hit your routine because you're prepared and you're you're fit, you get the consequence of that and a positive outcome. But uh, if you don't want to do your rope climbs and you don't want to do your beam series uh, after we've worked up to it and whatever it is, and you're just maybe low energy today, then that's fine. Don't do your strength. Go home. You're not going to stay here and bring everybody down like you no. can early. Yeah. But um, you know you have to deal with the consequences, whatever they are. And I think that's that's been really important for us to bring about because I think there was a time and a place where strength was punishment. Do it or you have 20 push-ups. Stop disrespecting me. Go climb the rope. Like, you know, when we started out, that was unintentionally still part of our culture, but was very much riding the line of abuse. And it's something that looking back, I think we're all sad that we allowed to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so let's very good on the gymnast. I think those are very good points. Let's shift gears and talk about, and I, I apologize. I know we're running long, but your time is okay. amazingly valuable. Um, let's talk about parents and then we'll just wrap it up there because I think that's another very big hurdle we had to face with, you know, new changing when we had parents, you know, who were embedded in our system and we're used to the, the way that things were going. But, you know, I don't think this is everybody, but we do have situations where the kids doing what they should do the coaches are great the staff's great but the parents are really misguided on maybe what the goals of doing gymnastics mm -hmm. are and they're looking more at the scores and the medals that come with their kids performance and they're gossiping about the judges scores and this and that or i hate to say this and we've had a few of these but they it seems sometimes that we're making decisions based on my worth as a parent is tied to the kid competing and making this meet. And if we're not in the meet, that's going to make me look bad or what's wrong with my kid and blah, 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 or, you know, getting those photos for Facebook on the top of the trophy stand. And how good do I look on Instagram with all my other friends, my moms and dads that are looking at me, you know, and I think we've had some really hard conversations, especially around injuries and competing skills and level move ups where we pulled the plug because we were worried about safety, especially like not even injury, but like, I don't want her to do this beam series because she's going to miss her foot on a layout step out or on a back handspring yeah. on her head and it's not worth the risk. And so let's, let's maybe have you talk about, you're amazing at this. Like this is one of your best signature strengths is the ability to de-escalate parent and gymnast conversations like this. So I really would like you to share some of those strategies for dealing with the parents on that. Yeah. So I think it's very important to be in a calm headspace when you're talking to parents. Um, <clears throat> And so just do whatever you have to do to get into that space. It's different for everyone. Um, and, and it's really important to help the, to help the parent understand where you're coming from and start by talking to them about where you're coming from. Mm. You know, I want nothing but the, the safest situation for your gymnast. I am looking out for her health and well-being, and so we've just you know we usually it's we because it's, <laughs> it's a team decision usually um, between coaches. We've decided that she's not ready to compete this skill on this event because you know we haven't seen enough in practice, or you know we're concerned about her ankle injury that she's still coming back from. And so I think you know if it's if it's if you can use safety and health and well-being when you're talking to the parents to help them understand the reason behind your decision, mm -hmm. I think that that helps diffuse them. Because if you if you but you have to you have to start there. That's the key. Yeah. Um, you have to start with, you know, I just love your gymnast. She is one of the most hardworking, dedicated gymnasts on our team. I mean she's hurting right now and she wants to compete this vault because she loves her sport so much because she works so hard it's like 
that's all true. You know, like the parents yeah. love to yeah. hear positive things about their kids. And, you know, it's, it's hard to argue when, as the parent, it's hard to argue when the, t- the teacher or the coach is, is speaking positively about good attributes. Yeah. Um, I would take that approach as opposed to saying, like, she's limping around in the gym and she still wants to throw this vault. Like, no, we're not letting her compete. Like you should be on our, our side with this and help, help us help her understand that this is the worst thing for her ankle. Like, no, she's limping around trying to convince coaches that she wants to vault because she wants this, right? Like she loves it. She loves to compete. She loves to vault. And so, so I think any way that you can kind of pull in to the conversation, the positives, um, about the situation uh, yeah. is is helpful. I also think that parents get into, and I call it mama bear mode. <laughs> so um, so I have a three year old. So I I I completely understand the mama bear mode thing, like in so much more detail than I ever did before. But but you know the parents that are invested in their children and see themselves as their child's number one advocate, right? Are gonna do whatever it takes to defend them, not only physically, but emotionally, right? So let's not forget that after we've told the gymnast in the gym that she's not competing, she goes home and the and is sitting at the dinner table and now the parent has to deal mm. with, with the backlash. So give the parent some tools yep. to help explain to the gymnast why this is happening, why the decision was made. Um, it, it could be about move ups too. You know, it's like these kids get so hung up on the level. And so it's like, you know, it's, you're not a failure, honey, because you're not ready for level five. You're actually simply just not ready for level five and it's not and we and it it doesn't change how much we adore you we adore all of our gymnasts it's it's really pretty simple do you have the skills or not here's the checklist um do you have them or not like if you have a certain percentage of these skills you're ready to move up we want to set you up for success that's another good one-liner for parents. Mm-hmm. We want to set your gymnast up for success. Yep. And, um, you know, because we've been in this game a while, we know how to do that. And so, you know, we are wanting her to stay on level four because if she does, then she'll build that strong foundation for level five and she'll be um, even more set up <laughs> for success when she gets to optionals. And some of the greatest optional gymnasts repeated a level at compulsories. Yep. And so, you know, sometimes the level four parents don't realize that until you tell them that, you know, some of the best optional kids um, spent some good time in compulsories and they're so good at optionals because they have that strong foundation. So again, it comes down to education. It comes down to giving parents tools that that they might need at the dinner table, because usually after the combative fighting <laughs> between the director or the head coach and and the parent, the parent usually breaks down and is like, I just don't know what to say to her. You know, yeah. I have to deal with her at home. She's already a grumpy teenager and now she's not going to move up or she can't compete. And like, I don't even know what to say to make her feel better. Sure that's the mama bear piece. They want to make their kids feel better. They don't like to see their kids suffering in any way. So um, give them some one-liners that they can repeat back to their kids or at least reframe in a way that they know their kids will be able to hear it. I like to remind the parents that nobody knows their kids like nobody knows your gymnast better than you do. You're her mom. Yeah. Ooh. Yep, yeah. Yep. Her moms love hearing that. Yeah. So, um, you know, if it's a behavioral issue in the gym that you're trying to deal with, like, you know, she's not going to compete at the next meet because 
she got an 8.7 and 7.9 and picked the chair up and threw it across the, the competitive floor. I'm sorry, you're suspended from the next meet. Like that violates 12 points in a <laughs> handbook, right? And so not to mention it's a safety issue because you're throwing chairs. So uh, what do you do at home? Like what are some things that you do at home when she gets angry or frustrated to help diffuse her, right? Like talk to me about strategies that have worked for you at home because you know her best, she's your daughter. Yep. Are there things you do at home that I can do in the gym to help her process through some of that emotion? Are there some replacement behaviors that we can help her um, adopt in the gym so that we're not throwing chairs across the gym? Um, you know, I, I think it's about partnering with the parents sure. to help their gymnast in whatever way it may be. It's move ups. It's scratching an event, it's behavioral issues, whatever it may be. Partner with the parents. They are your partner in crime, not yep. your enemy. And I think that is, it's that mindset that has helped us um, work with these parents and really help them understand how to help us help their kids. I totally agree. Yep. And I can definitely say from the coaching point of view, the best things we ever did is I, I highly encourage people to make that stoplight system or their version of that to have, you know, central guidelines and talking points. But, you know, I used to be the biggest offender of avoiding the parents like the plague and not <laughs> wanting to make them all them comfortable. And I think me slowly staying those five extra minutes to talk to one parent, you know, for a little yeah. longer, and not even about bad stuff, just catch up like, like oh, yeah, how's she doing? She's doing good. Yeah. You know, she's working. This is coming along. This is not like those very small micro events after the meet, you know, between practices, whatever it is. I think those make those go a long way to then Thank have you. conversations, but also to, you know, much better communication via email, you know, of like if something's a problem, you need to email us right away and please see, yeah. see all the coaches on this and Eva. It used to be like poor Mel, one of our other coaches would just get like onslaughts of text messages yeah. from parents about that. And we're like, hey, this isn't appropriate to just email or just text Mel by herself. Yeah. Email me, Mel and Eva uh, all together and we will, have a conversation and then if it goes further, we'll have a meeting together and we'll handle it. We're not gonna wait for this to fester for two weeks underneath the, the yeah. rug, pull it out and this dragon eats us because we haven't dealt with it, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. those are my parting thoughts, but. And parents don't like to be surprised. Yes, no blindsides. They do not like to be blindsided. So if you know a, a couple weeks before the meet or months before move ups, right? Yeah. That she's not quite there yet reach out to the parents, yep. you know? Um, that's why those regular stoplight evaluations are so important and don't let them get lost in the gym bags, right? Make uh, sure yeah. you're sending them home electronically so that yes. you're, you're sure that the parents are getting the information. Important. It's like the report card that gets lost in the school bag on purpose, <laughs> right? Um, make sure it gets home to the parents. And um, if there's a lot of red, then pick up the phone. Pick mm. up the phone. I know it's like an antique these days, but pick <laughs> up the phone. Have a conversation. A, a short 15, 20 minute conversation goes such a long way. And just the fact that you've made the call instead of typing the the, the, ge the generic email, right? Pick up the phone and have a conversation with the parent about their child's progress, especially if it's on the fritz. Sure. And um they will appreciate it. They'll appreciate the communication. And as long as when you're when you're talking on the phone, you're you're talking about strategies that you're employing to help them move forward, um, they'll just appreciate that you have a plan. They want to know that you have a plan for their for their athlete. And um, yeah, that's so important. They want to they they're looking to find what's wrong, and if so, what are the solutions? So if it's the beam series because they don't have enough reps on low beam or their shoulders are not flexible or whatever right. it is. They want to know that you have a plan in place for them and they feel right. like, okay, getting there, there's a process here. And I've yeah. made the mistake of waiting until the week of the meet to yes. tell the parent that she's not going to compete. And um, one parent said to me one time, you know, if I had known weeks ago, then we could have done some private lessons. Now, not that private lessons solve anything because, you know, I, that's a whole nother topic, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't get me started. But um, 
you know, the, the point was well taken that like, you know, if there was something we could have done, because parents are, again, the mama bear thing, the daddy bear, they want to, they want to take action and do something to help. So um, finding out the, the, the week of, or the day before, even worse, the day of the meet that, that their, that their gymnast is not competing a scale or not competing on an event or not competing at all is, devastating to them and they've felt like they haven't even been given the opportunity to help and also they're out of the loop yep. so now they're sitting amongst their peers in the stands and the parents of the other gymnasts are looking at them going oh so and so is not competing bars and the, to, to be the parent in that hot seat with no answers and for the other parents to know that that poor parent is just as surprised as they are is humiliating. Um, so yep. make sure they're prepared. Yep, and my last parting note, and then we'll wrap this thing up is everybody, parents, coaches, gymnasts, tether your worth and your value and your, your confidence in yourself in your values and your morals and your choices every day do not tether them to, are they competing? Do they move up? Do they have these scores? Because when you tether those things to things outside your control, which very much all those things are, you are vulnerable and you are setting yourself up for a lot of letdowns and disappointments and headaches. And I think we, you and I have both done that the wrong way, whereas we tied our self-worth to the kids' performances and it made us very upset. Uh, parents do that when they get that social rejection or that you know social pressure from other parents because they tie themselves as a parent to that and coaches to each other get that too. So gymnasts need to be taught that. I think we all need to do a better job of that because if you're doing the best you can every day, living in alignment with your values and yes. now you can go your way, you can be like, okay, well I did the best that I thought was possible in that situation. And I will try again. You know, you won't beat yourself up so much. And if you bring everything you do back to your mission and your core values, yep. then your moral compass will stay on track. Yep. Well said. Well said. Well, Eva, that was amazing. Two and a half hours almost. Um, <laughs> I can't thank you enough for doing it. I can't thank you enough for all the things that you do for us. And I think that this is a massively valuable episode for a lot of people who are looking for guidance and help in the gymnastics world. So I'm super grateful for you and I'm super grateful that uh, people are going to get a lot about it. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Talk to you soon. <laughs>